Okay, welcome everyone to the people here sitting in the audience in front of me and uh, to the people joining us remotely to our YouTube stream. Thank you so much for, for being here. This is Questions About Music, a series of conversation hosted by the U of A Department of Music. And uh, um, it's a forum, think of, of it as a forum for everyone, really performers, composers, academics, fans, family, friends. Uh, to come together and chat about musical things that make us curious. Uh, just as any colloquium series, we have um, invited guests, uh, sometimes joining from within the department, sometimes joining from um, outside. And uh, we want to converse on a variety of topics, really. But without, uh, just because we have so many other of those kind of formats, without formal presentation, without formal papers, so everything takes more the shape of a conversation with people. But the very title of questions about music, it's because um, this kind of platform, we wanted also for people within the community, from student, graduate student, undergraduate student staff, to come to us and say, we have a question about music <laughs> we would like to discuss. Or can you guys invite this person and ask this question? Because we are curious to engage with, uh, with them in a conversation. So it's really supposed to be uh, our ideas about what we want to discuss, but also yours ideas. So don't forget to get in touch with us at the end of this or via email about things that you'd like to see, uh, questions that you'd like to be asked in this forum. And um, towards the end of this session, I'll also give you an idea about some of the things that we've got cooking for next term. But uh, today, here and now, it's me, uh, Fabio Morabito. I'm a musicologist here at the University of Alberta. And I'm here with my colleague, Patrick Nicholson, who is also a musicologist here in the department. And he joined the department only this past year, so he's still quite new. And we are tremendously lucky to have uh, Patrick and to also to um, have this occasion today to talk about the real star of the show is Patrick, to get to know him a bit better, but also his new, brand new book, um, The Names of Minimalism, Authorship, Art, Music, and Historiography in Dispute, which came out just in January of this year, 2023, 2023. <laughs> well done, <Thanks>. exactly. <laughs> uh. um, and we we'll talk about, we'll chat about the book, about some of the insights, that, some of the questions that we wanted to uh, sort of like ask after this book came out. And, um, but just to give you a sense of the format, there's gonna be kind of like maybe a half an hour of conversation of question between me and Patrick. And then the rest of the event is question from the audience and questions from the online participants um, that I'm able to, um, to see the question they're gonna be asking from because I can read the chat, so don't hesitate to write in the chat people that are uh, joining from afar. I'll be able to read aloud your questions and integrate them in the discussion. And then last but not least, of course, this wouldn't be a proper colloquium series without uh, a drink afterwards. And <laughs> join us for the après questions about music for uh, our reception if you're here in town. Um, it, would be, it would be our pleasure to uh, treat you to some, some of these and have some even more informal conversation on the topics or other topics that you'd like to discuss and see represented on this platform. But without further ado, Patrick, thank you so much for being here yeah, thanks for tonight. Writing. Thank you so much for agreeing on chatting with me about your book. I'm so excited. Um, and maybe I thought we could start by the very first um, uh, word in your title, the, the idea of names. Um, because uh, normally when people ask me, uh, what do you do for work? I say like, I'm a musicologist. Um, the next question is like, oh, which composers do you work on? Or what is your favorite composer? Which is kind of like one of the two questions. And already that kind of question has a bit of baggage, right? Because immediately it assumes that if you are interested in music, you work on composers, on authors, on some names. So maybe could you tell us a bit more how, through the experience of your book, but also in your, through your own work, even that very questions about names, names comes with some baggage. It's almost like a bit policing without quite getting there. 
almost implicitly policing how we think about music through names. Yeah, that's a good one, thank you. Um, I think I think of like names, and then I think of probably like 10 ways that goes in the book under it. Um, and the one you're saying I think is really true where um, a lot of people tend to assume that as music historians that we're like dealing in a list of names and pieces and dates and the first piece to do this and the second piece to do that and the kind of those sort of orders of priority, um, which doesn't much interest me and I think is quite different than what most music scholars do these days. But yeah, in, in with that title, I'm also referring to, um, there's a philosopher who the book is very much about named Jacques Rancière, who has a book called The Names of History. So it's kind of also punning on that book. Um, but then too, that um, minimalism, I mean, not more than most kind of styles of music, but you know, alongside things like the VMU school, the second VMU school, <laughs> there has tended to be a real focus on a handful of composers that people think of as the minimalists. Um, and the book kind of simultaneously is very, very, very focused on them and very much trying to critique what holds them together as a group. And so one thing to point to with that too is that I think a lot of the really good research that's happened recently in relation to minimalism has been about expanding the kind of canon beyond those composers. Um, my good friends Will Robin and Carrie O'Brien have just done a book called On Minimalism too, where the, the real goal, one of their goals as I understand it or as I was explain it in brief, is to kind of expand from that really small group of composers to a lot of composers and to kind of notice the kind of minimalist impulse in a lot of places. And I've always felt a bit um, uncomfortable personally with kind of trying to take that approach because I think there's just still a lot to be said in terms of how we got to those four and why we have those four, what kind of methods you need to use to try to expand out from those four, what kind of things you assume. And so for me, it's like this kind of idea of names is something where both in terms of author's names and the baggage that that carries, but also the names of concepts and the names of places and the way we kind of name different periods and that all those kind of things um, have a way of becoming kind of too stable and using those as a starting point to then kind of go backwards and dig into how they kind of came together rather than using them as a starting point to then investigate styles yeah. or, or formalism or whatever. Yeah, else. it is so interesting because there's so much call at the moment for our field to um, not necessarily destabilize, but rethink the canon, for example. Mm -hmm. And one could think about the canon of minimalism, and one could say, like, who else was involved aside from these four people? No? Mm -hmm. And including, you know, all the collaborators that were that were dead, the performers, and also may maybe names and voices that were erased. And that's certainly mm -hmm. important work that is happening in our field. But I also find it fascinating that you say, like, what, what a moment, but how about those four and how they came into be as a canon? And what are the structure that made us think about those four uh, kings of the minimalism, whatever mm -hmm. we want to talk about, the, the main kings. names. No, it's, even I, worse, exactly. yeah. <laughs> it's even worse. It's even worse. But yeah, so, and I, I see your book really doing this sort of archaeology mm. of how we got there. And, um, and we gonna, maybe we should say, also for people that maybe not, not necessarily super familiar with minimalism, Right, and then no one should necessarily be already familiar with, with this. So how does it normal, how do these people, these names, these minimalists, is normally um, talked about in histories of music? So, so giving some, some context, but also because I think it's quite important because you sort of challenge how we tell the story mm -hmm. of these people, of these, of these musicians, of these composers. Yes, I mean the big famous people that I think if people tend to know minimalism that they might often know are um, like Steve Reich and Philip Glass and Lamont Young and Terry Riley. And again, a lot of the most important work in the last decade or so has been about saying is also Julius Eastman and Ellen Fullman. And I know in Will and Carey's book that someone like Alice Coltrane, even Miles Davis become important figures or McCoy Tyner, um, the pianist, or all these different figures that you can draw into it. Um, I think the thing that's been important to me is to say that what made that initial group of four people together makes sense in the first place. And I do kind of move beyond those four as well too, but they're kind of a, this kind of like intense buzzing set of pairs in the book um, because they, they kind of came together through really close collaborative processes that were very, very different from how we tend to understand how composers work. As in they didn't sit down and write scores and hand them off to performers and then have the pieces played. They tended to be composer performers working in dialogue with other performers who are also often composers and making pieces they very often kind of evaded working with scores. They prioritized, they were kind of the first generation to have like cheap 
tape recorders. So they'd often just have tape players running at their rehearsals and they would kind of use that to build the piece rather than a score. And so in a lot of this music, um, the kind of things that people have focused on in terms of formal concerns have been things like um, a return to diatonicism after like decades of serialist priority, long, 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 long durations and drone, um, things like gradual processes in relation to Steve Reich and his essay, Music as a Gradual Process, um, often tunings. There's all these kind of formal characteristics that get treated again when you start from the composers and then build to um, stylistic traits and then use those stylistic traits to expand the canon to more composers, I think you're again still missing what I prioritize, which is that all those stylistic traits came out of the fact that they weren't writing first. They were rehearsing and collaborating and living in lofts together and going to a lot of pop concerts and John Coltrane concerts. And I'm trying to treat that as the primary kind of unifying compositional thing. Um, which again, none of that's ever been unacknowledged, but it's never been treated as kind of the narrative center as far as I've seen it. And I think that's the interesting thing is that they were all in such close dynamic interrelation, including when they made the pieces that we tend to think of like music for and musicians or in C mm -hmm. or music in fifths and those kind of pieces, they were like practically all living together. They weren't quite, but they were in constant, constant conversation and contact and sharing resources and promoting each other's shows. Um, and I just consider that to be kind of the foundational unifying thing where a lot of the histories to date treat that as kind of a pre-story to them all kind of coming into dispute over who did what first or whose idea something was or um, other kinds of things that come down to, you know, money and prestige and priorities kind yeah. of things. And so people have tended to treat those early collaborations as kind of uh, a utopian moment that inevitably led towards them breaking yeah. up. Whereas I'm saying they can only break up because they had a moment together, which yeah. is nice. Yes. Yeah. No, I find it so fascinating that you focus on um, how this music came about. Uh, and that kind of like is a bit the inspiration for looking at this. And, uh, but why do you think then, um, because if you take a music history book and you open it, it says um, Riley in C. It's quite the name of the composition connected to the author. So this is how we tell the story. And I was wondering, why do you think that's the case? And, and what are we missing more, more importantly? You know, why is this collaboration sort of kind of erased or set aside or seen as something early and not very good, maybe? I'm pausing because there's like too many answers. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, I think one of the kind of framing ideas in the book too is that I think it kind of feels kind of tragic to me that I, part of the reason I think these composers kind of came into dispute and stopped, you know, getting along well and collaborating has to do with the kinds of documents and stories and oral history and autobiography you need to get together to impress people like us, um, to have us be convinced that you're worth writing about or that you might fit into my article or my book or my, my textbook or whatever. And so I think that's a big part of it is that, um, the, the, the format that music history tends to be taught in requires them to kind of like, like in the case of a lot of these, these musicians, they kind of made these pieces without scores, but then into the 80s and the 90s, they would have, um, rather speaking generally, so let's say Steve Reich, for example, hired the composer Mark Mellitz, who's a prominent composer now too, in the, I'm forgetting the details here, but in the mid 80s, let's say, um, to transcribe music for 18 musicians. Right. So it had never existed as a piece before. It had been it never existed as a piece in the Western music sense. It had been something that Reich's ensemble, who are incredible and like live and breathe that piece, had toured the world forever and taught other percussionists and taught students. Um, and then essentially Melis was hired to transcribe the, the score from the record like note for note. And that's the score that Boozy and Hawks eventually published. So there's these kind of things where um, the, the institutional requirements of pedagogy and music history and copyright and you know money getting paid and having a career and living um, I think really require us to demand of somebody to go back into those scenes and like grab things like pluck out the things I think we take it we too often assume that those are the most notable or the most worthwhile things and often they're just like the most exciting story to tell yeah. or the kind of you know the, the, the best gig or the funniest anecdote or whatever yeah. And so I'm trying to put them back into those things and, yeah. and think about what relations there were that are, I think, just good stories of you know interpersonal decency and relation and human humanity and stuff, rather than 
the competitive drive that people, I think, want often. Yeah, I think, you know, in your book, you're so, you, you're quite clear about how much we have sort of like inherited this model of authorship kind of like from the 19th century genius, to, to, be, to be brief that. Your world. <laughs> exactly, my world, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 the fault of my, it's the fault of my people. Uh, but, uh, so, it's incredible how much, you, you do so well in your book that it reminded me when people talk about um, uh, race neutral language in normal conversation and then you go to a music history class and it's not about race neutral but it's almost like author neutral. You assume that authorship is a certain thing because we have inherited this way of being a musical author as something that it's professionalized, that you know it's worthy to be in the musical museum, it's worthy to become part of the music history book. Uh, but all these things are kind of like in one, kind of in one package and people sort of like neutrally assume that when you talk about a composer, you're talking about that kind of thing. And you need to kind of like tick these boxes to be one. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this um, minimalist composer felt some of that pressure when trying to, poli to police these earlier collaborations and making them? Um, I mean, the story of Lamont Young asking people to sign, uh, yeah. that, that's quite something. Yeah, and that one is anecdotal. So actually, the cover of the book, um, right. there's some, like, for those people that are in the room, there's some um, flyers there if you want to order the book and get a discount. But you can also get it for free. It's open access, so it's just free online. Um, but the cover of the book is a photo of Lamont Young on the left and Tony Conrad on the right, who were two artists who worked in very close collaboration in the early, mid, mid to late 60s, um, essentially playing like drones for hours at a time, his work and the idea there, his work and the idea there being that Tony Conrad viewed their collaboration as being entirely egalitarian and that they performed drones because that allowed them not to have a composer and they could deliberate everything in conversation and have it be all very diplomatic, and or, no, not diplomatic, democratic. Mm. Um, whereas Lamont Young retroactively chose to view those performances as his music that they were playing. Um, and so, Tony Conrad being kind of an eminent, um, deeply critical, but also very funny kind of person, um, just picketed the concert and stood outside and tried to discourage people from going in and stuff. And I love that because it's, again, it's from 1990, looking back at the mid 60s and kind of that moment in 1990s when all the histories of this music started. And when I think Fousey and Hawk sort of published the Music Writer Teen Score around then, and a lot of the very important books on minimalism came out in the 90s, and magazines like The Wire in the UK were writing about minimalism a lot and giving it a big audience. And so, um, yeah, there's this sense that these disputes kind of emerge from people trying to sort out those past histories. And when you're in close collaboration and you're in a loft, and you, they did a lot of drugs too, these two <laughs> at least, like a lot of drugs. And so when they were in these lofts and they had tape recorders and piles of drugs and they were droning for eight hours at a time, it's, it's kind of part of the sort of theoretical framing for the book is to say that it'd be pretty easy to both misunderstand what you were doing together um, and to both leave with pretty different senses of what was happening. And not just, you know, in the sense of like, oh, they were high, whatever, just that they were, it's, you can see how people could have different views of what's going on while it works and gets along still. But then 25 years later, when one's trying to release CDs of the music under his own name, and tries to give release forms to performers and they turn that down and start picketing each other's shows, I try to make the case that kind of like that's like when minimalism starts, not in the mid 60s, but in that kind of moment of, of recognizing that no one agreed with what they were talking about. Um, and this is one of the big things from that philosopher Ron Sear too, is this idea of disagreements not being about, you know, a person saying yes and one saying no, but about both people agreeing, but not actually like talking totally at cross purposes in some sense. Um, he uses the term la maison temps, which in French kind of means like mishearing as well as misunderstanding, but also, um, I don't know the French this well, but I've, it's, it's written about as being kind of about like a familial bad blood kind of dynamic too, that yeah. it's like, you can't resolve this by more conversation or more dialogue. It's something that goes past um, the conversation. So there's this very lovely kind of Ranciarian idea of like, maybe no one ever knows what anybody else is actually talking about, but that's not a sad state. It's kind of the amazing, beautiful fact that we all still manage to be in conversation every day and, and, and function and get along. Yeah. Um, but when the stakes get higher and there's money involved and prestige yeah. and privilege and canonization, suddenly it becomes like, you thought what? Like, that's not what I thought. Yeah. yeah. It's so fascinating because, you know, this is a, one, one of the disputes in the book, you know, in a way, you know, this dispute is another term that is quite prominent in your title and is really kind of like 
um, driving the narrative of your book. But one of the things that I love the most is that you don't try to resolve the, the dispute. <laughs> you don't try to say like, oh, he is right and he is wrong. Or uh, let me tell you actually what happened when these people were in the garage and doing drones for eight hours. And I'll tell you who actually is the author. So you don't try to solve it, but you just as kind of like following this, um, this beautiful um, sort of like principle of Varsity, you kind of like embrace it and you use the dispute to get into this politics, very fraught politics of authorship that, um, that you think um, are the core of what minimalism is, more than maybe, am I right in assuming that you think that this, that this aspect of authorship are even more characteristic for, for you, for what minimalism is, than the more usual story about uh, the, the musical material being kind of uh, very reductive and minimal in that sense. Is, am I right in assuming that? Yes, you are. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for reading into that. I don't know if I wrote that in there anywhere, but thank you for reading into that. Um, yeah, it is. I mean, I think this is kind of one of the things that I hope, I hope that people in our field outside of just like minimalism studies read it, because I hope that, I think if anything, people who are deeply invested in minimalism might not find all that much in it. Like there's no like a now close analyses of particular pieces <clears throat> Um, I don't much expand to introduce some forgotten figure, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it's more about saying, like, what is minimalism for music history? And I think the big kind of point I make there is that at that moment when, when the most prominent composer, strong author kind of figures that we have weren't really being that anymore, and were specifically railing against kind of their teacher's generation in the 50s in Columbia and Berkeley especially, and other places on the world too, but Columbia and Berkeley in this sense, um, and Juilliard, that um, th they're, they're, that kind of image of the author as like the strong like person, often white man person at his desk writing notes on paper and like the headshot was kind of like becoming a less prominent thing, at least in the kind of dominant American imagination yeah. of the composition was. And really to me, a big part of this kind of in the more conspiratorial vein of it all is that like, minimalism kind of had to be turned inside out and into this kind of canonized form to sort of salvage an idea of authorship that I think they really, really successfully critiqued um, and revealed um, to be incomplete or kind of invented or fictional. And they were doing that again in very close parallel to people like John Coltrane or Ornette Coleman or free jazz players yeah. or later on kind of punk and no wave musicians. Um, and they, so I mean, there's kind of a sense in which they kind of had melted themselves into those scenes and that was kind of working for them to a point, but it kind of, to me, it seems like it wasn't working for musicology and for music journalists and for music critics and stuff, that they then kind of started to like, then like pluck them out of that melting again in some sense. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of the mental image I have of it. I think that their critique of authorship was really, really functional and quite strong, um, but in most treatments of that period, they're treated as like naive or hypocritical or immature or utopian or whatever. Um, and therefore kind of just reinserted back into the standard lineage of like, they, they followed on um, Schoenberg and, and Stockhausen yeah. and whoever else, and they were followed on by John Adams and yeah. Mark Mellis and whoever else. Yeah, I, I really like how, you know, because your book begins with the story of Lamont Young and Corrin and, and Conrad picketing. <laughs> and then when, when I kept going on, I was like, well, these people not, by not using score, by challenging compositional convention, they were also picketing in a way. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the sense that they were staging a protest against a specific notion of authorship. So I, I like that very much. But at the same time, I was thinking, uh, wow, and, and, you, and you do the really well in the book in, in saying like, well, the story had to become a teleology of some sort, of going from this early collaborative, not mature yet moment to the mature product of, as you said, like taking out the score out of those years of, um, so it's quite interesting how we kind of are used. So the author concept and the genius and the solitary sort of like a, a composer is certainly something that we are very much attached, but so too this idea that the history of music needs to be a teleology, something that mm -hmm. brings towards the next stage. And I think that your book kind of very nicely disrupted that in, in a very elegant way with this example of minimalism. But I am pretty sure, and I think this is food for thoughts for a thousand other projects, that as soon as you start zooming in a bit more on basically every composer and every moment, you you'll find that we tend to tell a 
teleological narrative about them, a, a move towards an end. It was like, oh, there was an early period, a middle period, and a late period. Oh, and this composer gave, um, started off this movement, and then these are the people that came later. How many times have you heard this kind of narrative when you talk about composers or musicians, or even when you read the, their bio um, in a concert program? So we, we're so used to it, and there's so much that you miss out, and sometimes it's more about the people are used to that format than then the story is written in that way than when, uh, than when actually, um, certainly, the, even if you think about Beethoven, I guess I'm, I'm <laughs> bringing that up, sorry. Um, but if I'm thinking about that, you know, the moment people start talking about Beethoven and the three periods, early, middle, and late, early sounds like, oh, Beethoven wasn't yet there. <laughs> that the actual good stuff is at the end, is late works, you know. How much are we kind of like, are we um, predisposed when we think teleologically? And I think your book does an amazing work in unpacking that. And I, uh, I think we should stress, you know, sometimes when we, when we pick up a book like this and we say, and we read the names of minimalism, you know, the first thing is that you think like, oh, this is a book about minimalism. I'm not interested in, in that period or in those, uh, names of minimalism, those composers, so I shouldn't be reading it. <laughs> Wrong, people. <laughs> Wrong, because people like Patrick do so much more work that is really supposed to um, give you so much food for thoughts, even if you work on medieval music, mm -hmm. in music in the 16th century, doesn't quite matter elsewhere. I actually encourage you all to read this, because, uh, but, but, but so, mo so much more in general, if you're interested in music, in musicology, in music studies in general, you should go beyond the, these labels and say like, oh, that's where I'm interested, what I'm interested in. There's so much more interesting work being done that really speaks to, this, to the field as a whole and to categories that are important throughout authorship. Mm. Um, narratives of historiography, what historiography does, who does the policing, Oh, just, I was thinking, I just had a thought that I didn't want to forget because what you're saying, but last night, this is off topic, but it's anecdotally relevant, but um, last night, the, the show Ted Lasso, which like a lot of people are watching, where it's just, it's like very sweet and very friendly and everyone's nice. And last <laughs> night, my partner and I were just talking about how, like, how different it is than most TV, because most TV relies so much on that kind of, like, unspoken thing where there's some kind of, like, bad blood between two people, and the fact that it's simmering and you know it's going to explode at some point is the entire, like, kind of narrative interest and like that kind of thing. Whereas in Ted Lasso, they have to find actual other tricks to create like interest and continuity that aren't just like the bad blood thing. And so I make a similar kind of comparison in the book too about like um, like kind of the whole like cop drama thing of like they used to be partners. <laughs> it's that kind of thing where you can make like narrative interest without doing any work by implying that things were complicated before. Um, and so I think, yeah, to me, these kind of things are, are primarily you know, the historiography part of the title is these are all just stories. <laughs> we try to make them as, you know, rigorous as we can, but they're all just stories. Yeah, they are. I think a lot of historians don't often like hearing that, but I think it's basically just true. Um, and so there's that, that part of this too. I'm an historian, I love hearing that. No, I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we get along so well. <laughs> <laughs> no, one of the sentences that I, that I read in this book that really stayed with me, um, and I want you, uh, that it stays with you as well, uh, it's, um, this is Patrick talking, you know, after, complicating this picture of what, of, of what an author is. Um, Patrick says, quote, a modality of authorship is chosen just as much as the pitches and rhythms associated with it. So imagine a music composer that not just chooses the notes or the medium, the tape, or the length, a long, a long, very much a lot of length in this case, but also deciding what kind of author they want to be or they are in relationship with interviewers, partners, collaborators. So uh, think about that throughout music history, not just in Europe and colonial imaginaries, every act of musical authorship is a decision of what that thing is. So it's really kind of like um, a fabulous reminder to complicate that. Every time you engage with a music creator, it would be, it would be quite interesting to see how, what, what was authorship for them or for in this particular case. Um, does it make any sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I think that was a big part of what I was thinking of um, in there is that among this group of, of kind of authors, composers, I mean, I think the kind of the backstory to this too is that um, 
I guess during grad school when I was, this, this book was my dissertation, which changed a fair bit, more and less. Um, but during my kind of, my dissertation was always this kind of thing at conferences where I would say that people are, you know, railing against authorship or critiquing authorship. And there was an invariably the question period, for the first few years at least, was kind of like, well, they still have their name on the piece, or oh. their name is still on the album cover, or like they still are using a name. Um, and this kind of way that the general idea of kind of the Western liberal subject and the author kind of like stuck together as kind of a thing that has to necessarily like legally precede any kind of work that can happen and then be attached to it forever and ever and ever. Um, but I guess what I try to do here is the point out that people have really, really, really different ways of being authors, especially as tape and records and concerts became opportunities. And so, um, so you mentioned before that I don't um, arbitrate the disputes, which I try not to do, and I've already heard from a few people who disagree and think I arbitrate them <laughs> far too strongly, um, which is interesting too. Um, but I mean, yeah, there's, there's people in the book who like, like Bill Glass, I find a really kind of admirable person is kind of in, at least in aspects of his working practice beyond his compositional style, because he used to talk in the 70s and stuff about how his whole goal, why he toured so much, is that he wanted to ensure that his ensemble, which was like his band, they toured together the world, had like health insurance. So there were so many like days per year they had to play so he could get them health insurance and employ them and guarantee them unemployment benefits. And like that's a way of doing work. And there are other people in the book who like, you know, us have been spoken of as having like handed out contracts that ensure that you won't say this or that and you won't do this and that and you acknowledge that this person did everything here. And so I was trying to think of that kind of thing that, you know, what kind of, um, because it's also much about dispute and collaboration, what kind of people were the people being as they made their work mm. um, without getting too like judgmental or yeah. psychoanalytic or anything, but like, you know, what, what material outcomes were produced by the way they tried to behave as artists working in the world. And some people provide really beautiful models, and other people you kind of think, why would they behave that way? That's terrible. <laughs> why would you do that to people? <laughs> um, and that's important to me to kind of notice that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, um, I enjoyed this very much. And um, just to kind of like to, to quote yourself again oh, from uh, about um, something that you just said, against police history, I insist that authors do not pre-exist their work, mm. which I find fabulous. So like this idea that if you think of the author pre-existing, you are already policing history a bit um, as we started this conversation that asking who do you work on, which composer do you work on, you're sort of like pre-imposing that notion. You, you're assuming that someone, an author, a specific author pre-exists the music, mm -hmm. which is quite fascinating. Anything else you want to add before we open the floor to this fabulous group of people in front of us and the online? <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and the online spectators. Uh, anything that, that you'd like to say that we haven't touched on? Um, um, trying to think. Um, yeah, I guess I, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think I, think I would just say that I, I hadn't really read the book since it came out until last night, preparing for our conversation, which you very generously <laughs> invited me to have. and I. I felt um, I'd fin it's, it's such a kind of a nerve wracking thing to release a book because I kind of went from being stressed out about the fear of not finishing it or it not being accepted by peer reviewers or whatever to now kind of being afraid of like, you know, a negative review or someone being bothered by it or whatever. And so it's like, it's again, this kind of whole thing of this, in this relationship where you can kind of change the, the track, the changing dynamics of it. But last night reading it, I felt like really uh, excited by it too. And so I hope, I hope that they're, um, will be folks who read it and respond to it. And so I'm really grateful that you invited me to talk about it, so thank you. It's been yeah. a pleasure, yes. And I think the, the last part is my favorite. So I hope that people who read it, I know that I and many people in academia, you know, grab a book, read the intro, footnotes, skim. I feel like the, the end is the good part. <laughs> do, you wanna, do, do, you tell us, do you wanna tell us something about the end? Like uh, before, before we open That's not question. a hook to like stay for the whole thing. It's just like, if you're gonna read part of it, maybe read the last part. Um, <laughs> The, the last part is kind of like, it's kind of like I tried to jump into my new research project, which is more about, um, it continues a lot of the themes around authorship and ownership and property, but to more being about graphic scores um, and kind of like really great indigenous noise music scenes right now, and I think reggae more and more. So it'll be kind of more around dispossession. And so the kind of last section is trying to talk about how a name like minimalism um, 
we, the way we think that kind of adding more and more and more to it and making it bigger and bigger and broader and broader does kind of benevolent, inclusive, beneficial work. And I often worry that whether under the name minimalism or under the name musicology yeah. or even music, that we should keep in mind that bringing in everything might also be a gesture of like grabbing and grabbing and grabbing. And so the last section is kind of about how, how that word um, made it difficult to talk about some things or how words can kind of, like very often people will kind of, in some of the older scholarship of minimalism, they'd go back and they'd say, someone said minimalism here, but they weren't really using it precisely, or someone used it here, and that was a really good early use. But like, our way of talking about it has made other things harder to talk about. Like, or when I was writing the book, it kind of in a more mundane sense, it was kind of during like the Marie Kondo like Netflix time too, and people were like, oh, minimalism, cool. I'm like, oh, not that. Not that. Um, and so just I, just, I guess I keep finding it really important to talk about how you know, words can often be things that kind of like sit on top of other things and make it hard for people and communities to talk about things that they used to talk about in a different way. Yeah. So that these words can kind of be like something parallel to a colonial or a gentrifying yeah. kind of force that make it hard for communities to talk about things that they used to talk about yeah. in very different contexts. Yeah, they, they anchor things in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, I find it, um, so the names of minimalism, so minimalism is also a name mm -hmm. that you problematize in this sense. In this and sense. there's a really good other recent book too, and there's been three recent books on minimalism. Mine is just one, which is really exciting. I mentioned um, Carrie O'Brien and Will Robbins's On Minimalism, which is like a, I haven't actually seen it yet because it's like coming this week. Um, but like it's a collection of like source readings and source texts that they contextualize. But also in 2020, Christophe Laveau wrote a book called We Have Always Been Minimalist. And he does a really amazing job of like tracking all the kind of dead end terms that people used to name this particular repertoire. So not naming minimalism, but kind of saying names that journalists and critics and historians use to try to kind of hold together groups of artists yeah. like this in that moment. And it's so amazing to see how many you know, dead ends there are and how many things don't stick. And that reminds me again just of the, the kind of power of these sort of stories that we can tell and how, how hard they can be to um, evade them once they set foot. And then also the dangers of letting them grow and contract and expand rather than saying, what is it? Like, what does it do? Where is it? Yeah. How is it? What sort of work it performs yeah. in a way. Yeah, so fascinating. And, um, I'd say stay tuned for more for uh, me and Patrick undoing the Viennese school <laughs> or, or things that now. Nah, it's, 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 it's a way of saying kind of like sometimes we use these this names this term, mm -hmm. and they are doing, they, we, they are reiterating certain, certain things that, do, that organize society in a certain yeah. way. And we're just unaware. So it's not about undoing it, but it's more about becoming aware of the baggages that, that these words, uh, these names have. Mm -hmm. I would say enough from us chatting, and mm -hmm. I'd love to open the floor for questions from the audience and from the um, online spectators. But so far, I see nothing on the on the YouTube chat. So people in the audience, ask away. Mm. Guillaume. Uh, the way that you're describing uh, right now the name and, and so on, the, what this contains, is that close to the concept of brand? Brand? A brand that you would say has been affixed to these uh, creators without maybe necessarily all agreeing with it, but they all have to now abide by this this idea of or this brand, this this image or logo or wh whichever thing. Uh, is that something that you talk about in the book? I do not, but I I mean I think it would be similar. I mean I don't I don't have anything smart to say about brands, but I mean I think that comparison makes a lot of sense. In the I mean. In, in the third chapter is very much about interviews that the kind of prominent minimalists gave in this period. And I do a lot of instances where I kind of like side by side compare like two interviews from years apart and they say almost the exact same thing, like verbatim, um, in a pair of interviews. And so I suppose that'd be that kind of thing too, right? If you're, if you're on a, I mean, if I'm sure if I had 10 of these, I'd say a lot of the exact same things too. I have just this one, so I get to. <laughs> I get to get out with, with not repeating myself. But I think there's a similar thing, right? That there's this notion that composers need to build up kind of their body of concepts and works and stories and autobiographical tales. And so, I mean, one of the prominent ones is like Steve Reich, his name is attached to the idea of phasing or a gradual process. And that that's kind of one of the sites of tension is that someone like Terry Riley says, oh, I was also doing phasing at the same time when we were hanging out 
And they kind of fall in these battles over, you know, and the way the historians have tended to treat that is who did it first, who influenced whom, um, where is the proof, what documents can we fall upon, which record releases, which dates. Um, but a big part of it to me too is, the, is this kind of idea that it's just, it's a concept that, that names a set of practices that they're involved in, which I guess is kind of what brands do too, but I, I, I don't know much yeah, about one, brands. One aspect I think of it is conflicts over brand. Mm. Like some of these composers could say, well, I claim property on this, and what you're doing is a derivative of what I'm, but I'm owning this, this idea. Yeah. And that in, in copyright law, we cannot own an idea we can, uh, we can own a, an expression of the idea. And there's, I mean, so one of the case of the, this kind of duo on the front too is that um, there was eventually in 2000, the, the one kind of official album release um, from this music of the 60s that they did, the, the long, long, long drones, um, was, a, and there's a very long story of it that I, I wrote about in there, but essentially one of the tapes ended up being released as a CD by a very small record label in Atlanta. Atlanta called Table of the Elements. Not very small, very, very important, but they ran small experimental kind of things. Um, the owner, Jeff Hunt, I talked to a bit in here too. Um, but so essentially, they released this CD without Lamont Young's permission, the person who'd wanted it to be very contained, and they, re they issued it as by, equally by all five performers on the CD, which then led to Lamont Young taking out a copyright on the recording after the album had come out. So it's actually, the CD exists and it has a copyright, but there's also like a filed like US copyright by Lamont Young from like two weeks after Tony Conrad released the CD. So it's, I mean, I don't, I don't know how many, other, I'm sure there are other instances of that that have happened too, but that's pretty strange. Um, and again, this notion that they're both making a property claim in the exact same 40 minute long recording, that's essentially a garbled, horrible <laughs> mess. You can't tell what's happening, it sounds terrible. Uh, it sounds like a bunch of tape noise and like modems connecting. <laughs> um, I love it, I, I adore it, but it's not, a, it's not something worth building a career on, which is part of the point here in the book too, but I'm also now thinking that part of the book too with the names is this idea of homonyms um, and the idea of when words cover things up and so with branding, I'm also now thinking of like brands and like burning things into like animals and stuff and you know there's, there's yeah, that, that kind of idea can go in a lot of ways. When you, when you physically burn your name into something, it's a different kind of action too than the kind of corporate idea of what branding is about. I don't know if I can answer all that. Thank you, Guillaume. Is that Great. in that direction? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. If I can, I, yeah, just, it's kind of along those lines, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, you think about the legitimizing, or branding, legitimizing by writing. The, the idea of music being if it's either in written form or, or it's in a form on paper where you can see it and therefore it's transmitted or whether it's on recording or whether it's written about and uh, so here you are in your own authorship uh, you're you know you're you're part of the deconstructing or legitimizing or you know telling the story and don't you, don't you think that's really the, the biggest element that we why we create place labels as well. The idea of placing labels is to, to try to identify something that's going on that's actually very hard to describe, uh, whether it's an era or a period or a style. Like, can you talk a little bit about that struggle? Uh, yeah, that's a nice question, thank you. Um, I, um, I think it's part of the fun challenge. I think to me the always important thing is to try to account for these things in a way that doesn't, that doesn't like make overstate any claims of how substantive or, or concrete these kind of things are. And tons of, I think tons of writers are really good at that. So it's not something you know, that's, that's like my idea, but it's just an important thing to me. Um, and so I try to write, I mean, it's, it, the book is pretty chaotic at times. Like I got a headache reading the intro <laughs> a while ago one day. It, I'd already had a long day, but I was rereading the intro and I was like, whoa. This goes. Um, so I'm, I love that and I enjoy it. But I think a big part of me is I, I kind of almost undercut almost everything I also say a lot of the time too. Um, and I think this kind of thing of, you know, like joking as I say things is important to me too. And it's, you know, there's a certain degree of like privilege and self dismissal in that too as while I'm on camera and in this room with all of you at the university and everything. But um, I think it's just important to recognize that, to try to find ways to signal that the story you're telling is one way a story can be told 
um, and then to me to kind of think about what the kind of ethical or narrative implications are of that framing of the relationships in play. Um, and that a lot of the time it comes down to like, um, like in the case of a lot of these, I think again, getting very abstract here, but in some of these cases, like a lot of the pieces here that are scored are scores that were transcriptions from after the fact. And there's kind of these instances where scores and transcriptions are treated as if it's kind of the same, either way the person wrote it, what does it matter? But I think in terms of as a historian, they're definitely decidedly absolutely not the same. Um, and in the sense of if one of these composers transcribes a tape of a group improvisation to submit to a, Gru a Guggenheim grant, which happens in here, um, to claim property in that by writing it down does some kind of problematic, thefty, dispossessive things to me. But I think we've gotten used in a lot of cases to treating that as still just another instance of authorial inscription, but we need to be careful about what kind of um, timelines and narratives that upholds or how sometimes writing these down can be stealing other people's music or those kind of property claims that come into that stuff too. So, um, and, and what about the role of the musicologist in that too? <laughs> like, I, I, and I, I'm not trying to, I, I'm just curious uh, because I feel like that element actually is so important mm -hmm. from, from performed music or, or living music that's being made and the, that dialogue between musicologist or, or perhaps uh, uh, you know, any written media uh, to help legitimize whatever is going on musically, which can't be somehow contained. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what about the role of musicologists? Yeah, that's a good question. I think this is again the kind of thing that I'm really glad that like Fabio and I and others in the department, and Michael's here and um, Julia and Brian and plenty of other people in the, in the, in the department more broadly, but I guess I'm thinking in the academic area that it feels to me as if there's a real thought about like, you know, what are these disciplines and what is our job? And I think if someone was to ask me like to define musicology, like you use the word like legitimize and that would have never even crossed my mind that that was one of our jobs. And so this again falls into kind of the whole thing of, you know, these kind of homonymic trajectories of these words that I can say I'm a musicologist and everyone in the room has a different idea of what that means. And we get by and that's functional and, and beautiful that we can manage to communicate at such cross purposes. But I mean, yeah, I, don't, I, I hope that what my job is isn't to legitimize things. But I think what the job is is more, I mean, in kind of a pedagogic end, it's kind of to um, trust people, to trust their own listening, or to think about you know, narrative structure. And I, I, when I was, at, I was at University College Dublin for a postdoc last year, and my mentor there was Jamie Jones, who said you know, dozens of wonderful things. I watched her teach one day, and it was the first day of her like, undergrad class, and she was like, I'm an ethnomusicologist. That means my job is to find ways to write words about sounds. <laughs> it's like, cool. That's a good description. Like, you know, you conduct and perform. Yeah. I write words. It's so I think to me, the, the big thing isn't about like who's legitimizing work, but more, you know, what what kind of media relationship you have with music and sound. And to me, it's just I write stories about hopefully factually grounded ones, <laughs> well, well researched and critical ones, but like stories about stuff. Yeah. And my mode is most often to go into ones that people have already written and point out how they assume some very strange things mm. about authorship and property and owning things and stealing things and yeah. those kind of things. Yeah, that reminds me that the anecdote about your mentor in Dublin reminds me kind of like me and Michael at the, at the undergraduate uh, orientation this year that it, it, we had to explain to an audience what musicology and ethnomusicology were and we came up with the same thing <laughs> And I was like, well, we, we should talk more about this. <laughs> this <laughs> is important to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have a question from one of, of our uh, remote uh, attendees, um, Justin Kenneville. Oh, and, uh, is it a real question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, um, I love you, Justin, sorry. <laughs> does streaming eliminate or further complicate authority in recordings of improv? Streaming? Yes. As in like music streaming? Yeah. So the, firm, the, former, the former version of the question, like where do you see issues of authorship going as streaming becomes the main platform mm -hmm. for new artists? I don't know. I find that hard to respond to thinking in terms of the book. Mm. But I mean, I just taught a seminar that went really wonderfully, and some of the students are here. Thank you for coming. Um, that was called Who Owns Music? Um, and we got into streaming a little bit, and the, the way that there's a lot of conversation around streaming and kind of AI and these kind of things that as being very much the, you know, the future and what, what benefits he's offered to artists and on and on and on. But there's also a lot of very weird, creepy things about them, like mm. the fact that um, 
If anyone's not heard of song funds, go home and Google Merc Mercuriartis and the Hypnosis Song Fund, which we're essentially we're is just someone, you know, there's a company who is insisting that um, because of Spotify and streaming monthly revenues that um, songs are now a more reliable investment property than gold or currency. Um, and so he's essentially going around and buying up like Justin Bieber's catalog most recently, I think they own the entire Journey catalog, I forget who else, but basically there's, you know, there are investment funds of like venture capitalists buying up bulk song copyrights so that when Spotify receives that, I don't know, billion dollar a month payday of the subscriptions, they can now claim two or three percent of it. And next month they'll try to get six or seven percent of it. Um, and so I don't know about the particular question of improvisation or what or how that would tie in. I mean, again, it's all about, I guess, ownership and, and property in music. And there are people who are viewing songs as investable, locatable properties that can be, you can own like one third of Neil Young's <laughs> music or like a tenth of Baby by Justin Bieber for investment purposes, right? And so I think that to me is the kind of thing where for all of the optimism towards what streaming allows and access and, and lower prices that, um, there are a lot of very dark, weird questions mm. we sh music scholars and music fans should ask themselves before we kind of just buy into it fully. Um, and I know, I mean, I, in my undergrad class I taught last term, every single student had Spotify, and so they asked me if I would get Spotify to make like listening lists on there, and I was like, no. Because <laughs> I just, have, I just have, a I have a real aversion to getting a streaming service account. Right. I buy lots of music at record stores and on iTunes, which makes me, I believe, very, anachronistic <laughs> in the modern world. But, but yeah, it's, 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 there's a weird way people are buying up songs as like properties, investment properties. Yeah. It certainly makes a, you know. Oh, sorry. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Go right ahead. Finish your thought. No, no, no. No, I, I was just saying like food for thought, like just in the same, in the same way as these artists were, um, especially when you think about collaboration. Mm -hmm. How, I, I was thinking about this question and how, um, see streaming platform use names to make you navigate the platform in a certain way. And I'm thinking about that structure and how you find stuff, how you think about the stuff that you listen to because it's, it's presented through uh, categories of... Or you choose like workout yeah. and you get whatever, but also, you know, it's like Spotify is very much working on like that when you choose workout, it generates two hours of AI content that they don't need to pay anyone for. Yeah. And so these are kind of, again, the fears of what, what I think those streaming and AI companies yeah. are, are dreaming of right now. Yeah, super interesting. Good idea. Um, yeah, how did, how did um, commissioning factor into like this early era, era of these 60s and 70s with these composers of this community of composers? Was that something that was being done? Huh. I don't think, um, I'm just trying to think that I want to just yeah. prattle and be wrong. I don't think any of them were getting commissions in the earliest kind of period I talked about here in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big draws of kind of the whole 60s New York romance is that it was very, very, very cheap. Um, and so people were able to live there and kind of get cheap places to live and cheap instruments and stuff like that. Um, Later on, commissioning became a big thing. Like, kind of the first commissions I can think of were in the late 70s or early 80s, like Reich and Glass, um, from kind of major American ensembles. And it was kind of right, this is kind of where chapter four starts, is that around that moment when like Steve Reich was commissioned for an orchestral piece, all the magazines and newspapers were like, oh, minimalism is dead. They're now writing orchestral pieces and it's <laughs> dead. And that was kind of the tone of the conversation. Um, and then there's been 40 more years of minimalism by them or whatever else since. Um, but I mean, one of the big kind of famous sort of commissioning dynamics is that Lamont Young and his partner Marion Gisela were given like bajillions, that's a, that's a ballpark figure, <laughs> of dollars. Um, and they moved into this like, what was the building called? Um, it was like a, it's a massive like block sized building in, in kind of the southern end of in downtown New York that they had like a four story building and they had like a millions of dollars per year budget where they had a whole floor kind of performance space and they had money to kind of be hiring assistants and they run kind of, they've been running this beautiful um, sound and light installation called the Dream House kind of nonstop since the 60s, which is in their apartment right now, but it was in this massive space for years and years in the 80s because they were kind of, um, they were kind of the preferred artists, musicians of the, the de Menil family and kind of the oil money of that family. Um, so this is the same family that kind of runs the, the Dia Beacon and the Dia galleries and all the kind of minimal sculpture galleries. And so there were these instances of kind of some of the first commissioning being like 
not here's a pocket of money, write me a piece. It was more like here's millions of dollars to live and create as you will do for the next, I think it only lasted seven or eight years in Lamont Young's case, but he negotiated that for sure as very much about being like, his work is about durations and he wanted somewhere where his Bosendorfer could sit and it's beautiful, just sensation tuning for months at a time and not waver in pitch and be tuned every day to ensure it didn't waver in pitch. And so he had very specific conditions. So kind of an odd idea of what commissions would be, but that was one of the very big kind of influxes of money into this group. Um, or like Tony Conrad was a professor at um, SUNY Buffalo for years too, so in terms of kind of funding for where his work came from, but his work then was mostly kind of film and performance arts and stuff rather than music. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay then. Uh, yeah, thanks. Just, I actually want to hop back to the comment before about Spotify and the investment mm. fund going in this way. And you said something interesting, that the investment fund is wanting to offer you a chance to invest in the music. That's not what they're doing. No, yeah, right. They're giving you a <laughs> chance to actually invest in the authorship and continuing on to do so, right? They're mimicking, uh, you can do, these have been around for a couple of years at this point, but giant funds that invest in fine art. I actually, and I, I you may hate me for this, I have invested in those before, they're super interesting. Because you don't care what the actual object is that they're investing. They're a fund. You're alienated from that in some sense. All I care about is that they hold a few Picassos, a couple of Banksy's, and that these names are the things that are floating out there that hopefully in five years they can turn around and sell for profit. Or in the case of the music, you're getting a dividend off of the sales that are attached to that name. So yeah. I don't know. So it's not a question of comment, but sort of the linking your into streaming and things like that too, right? All of that depends on authorship, but actually as like the music itself in some ways is a secondary factor. Yeah, that's great, thank you, yeah. It's funny again, so a, a statement like investing in music, like what music means there is deeply ambiguous. Sure. And you're right, it's not, it's not what it sounded like, it's more that they are buying up the rights to receive the royalties from streaming sales. Yes. <laughs> um, they're investing in the rights to be the, the benefactors of that, that money. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, and they even, in hypnosis is, um, I'm gonna get like, like blocked on the internet or something, saying <laughs> hypnosis in front of a room of people. Um, they're like, investor reports are public reports, and they, they use the term proven songs, the capital P, capital S, as in like, don't stop believing, will probably never stop yes. being a money maker for them month to month. Um, so that's a proven song. Proven song. And you know, I, I guess I think if, if musicology is anything, <laughs> which, it, which it must be, because I'm here, <laughs> then, then it should be engaging a question like, what is a proven song? And what is what is it without that what, is, what has song and music yeah without legitimizing what has song and music become that venture capitalists are down to buy don't stop believing and assume that it's infinite kind of capital returns long 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 term or you know what and it's it's always in the same way that copyright has always been that the people doing copyright policy and copyright investing always frame it as being about artist rights mm -hmm. um, it's probably no, almost always not, not quite yeah. Um, yeah. So this is my, this is kind of the future project stuff we're getting. Yeah. These questions of ownership and property and music and how this kind of stuff changes over time, how it, how it kind of piggybacks on and assumes past relationships that we think are harmless and lovely and important, like, you know, investing in music or paying artists or commissioning artists when you're actually like spending money to remove um, money circulating in, in local music economies towards song funds and investment yeah. properties. Well, I think that this is the perfect note to wrap up you know you said you, you know we, we had a, a very good discussion about your book and you mentioned things that you the interest and kind of like almost kind of like uh, blossomed from this project into the into the new one and the, the direction of your work so i just am excited for more of this <laughs> <laughs> i can't wait to hear more uh thank you everyone for joining today remember mm -hmm. to to download this for free if you want or uh, i even better use the discount code there's a discount code for 30 percent off for 30 in the room off. and online yeah exactly if you want the physical thing um but uh come back also for more questions about music next next term we'll have uh um uh really world famous guitar performer that's gonna visit us for uh, on in, in his first tournament through Canada and we're gonna ask him a quite, kind of a bit of a question about how did they make it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are also a YouTube phenomenon um, and they started really doing that in their own uh, bedroom kind of like recording. This was before the pandemic and that's how it sustained uh, themselves. So I'm sure that a lot of uh, people in the department that study uh, performance will want to know more about this sort of like almost entrepreneurship. We're thinking about another session on AI and music. So make sure to, st to, uh, <laughs> to stay tuned about um, question about music. But for now, uh, it's everything. And I invite all of you to join us for the après, uh, for, the, um, for our 
refreshments. And thank you to Russ and Pat for thank the beautiful TV Thank you so much for, uh, for the TV, TV style, set yeah. and, the, <laughs> and, the, and the set. Thank you again for, uh, to, for, Patty for joining us in this conversation. Thanks, Shall we? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Fabio. Wonderful. Thank you. Come and have a drink with us. Do we know where we're going? Does everyone have you say to you?